Okay, four transmissions of Dzogchen teachings uh, in Bonn, and we've been discussing the Zhangzhen Nienzhu. We have more to say about that, but we'll briefly mention the other three. So we are talking about the Atri system, coming from Meodern uh, Gongse, Rita Chempo, uh, and uh, uh, he... Uh, Got the teachings from the Kappa Gukor, which is a, a series of Dzogchen, uh, Dzogchen texts uh, found in the Termas of uh, Shenzhen Luga, but also took material from the Chipung, uh, which is uh, basically Tantra, but as I said, the culmination of, of Tantric transformation practice here is uh, uh, Dzogchen. And uh, then he put this into 80 sessions of practice. This was later condensed into 15 sessions uh, by uh, Jawa Yungdrung, uh, the same uh, Lama and Abbot of Menri who wrote this book. And this is a text called the uh, Atri uh, uh, Tunsen Chong Yaba, the 15 uh, sessions of Atri practice. This has been largely translated into English by Per Caverna and published by the Tibetan Library of Works and uh, Archives. So it is available in English. This uh, approaches Dzogchen from uh, the Semde point of view, uh, so quite uh, similar to the Nyingmapa uh, presentation. And uh, previously, this was the Dzogchen largely taught at uh, Menri, and including when Menri was reestablished at uh, Dolanji in India. So when Per Caverna first vi visited there, he's a, a Nor Norwegian uh, scholar of uh, Tibetan studies. Uh, it was largely uh, Atri that people were doing. But Lopen Sanjay Tensing had a vision of, uh, of the wisdom goddess Sipa Jelmo, who said, uh, hey, you guys, you really have to start teaching Dzogchen now, because if you don't do it, it's going to be lost in a generation. And due to her influence, then he started teaching the Zhangzhen Nienju. And when he passed away, his student, uh, Yongzen Rinpoche, the Tenzing Namda, continued uh, teaching. At that time, uh, Geshe Tenzing Wangzhou was a student there, and so he took uh, the Zhangzheng Ninju teachings twice, first from San Sanji Tenzing, and then se secondly from uh, Yongzen Rinpoche after Sanji Tenzing uh, passed away. And it's with the authority of Sipa Jomo that the uh, Yongzen Rinpoche has gone public with uh, Dzogchen, for which he's been criticized in certain uh, sectors of uh, Tibet, saying these teachings are too high for Westerners. They shouldn't be uh, given the, this at all. They're these primitive barbarians here in these uh, misty Western uh, countries. Uh, they should only be given uh, Ngundro and not much else. Well, even Trungpa Rinpoche uh, complained about that when uh, that proposal uh, came up. So there was uh, some uh, criticism in, in certain uh, quarters, but uh, we have uh, Sipa Jelmo on our side, so we don't give a damn. <laughs> uh, the second uh, transmission is known as simply as Dzogchen, uh, but the text here is the Yangtze Longchen, which means the great vast expanse of the highest uh, peak. And this draws upon a, another set of uh, uh, Dzogchen texts, the Drakpa Korsum, uh, the three cycles of re revelation. And this comes uh, not from Shenzhen Luka, but from the Uter, Uter Luk, the central treasure system, because uh, in the 11th century, a lama by the name of Shirten uh, Ngodrup Drakpa, you don't have to remember all these names, but uh, he went to the Kut uh, Kumting Temple in central Tibet, and behind the statue of Vairochana Buddha, he found all these Dzogchen texts as well as some other things. And this included 
uh, this uh, Drapa Korsum and this Yangtze Longchen. Uh, the Yangtze Longchen was written by Lishu Takren. In the 8th century, there were two very important uh, Dzogchen teachers among uh, the Bumpos. Uh, one of them is uh, Lishu Takren, who is responsible for this tra tradition. And the second was uh, Dren Panamka, who is uh, responsible now for this fourth system uh, or transmission known as the Yetri Tassel. Uh, the Yetri Tassel means removing the limitations from the uh, primordial state. And the limitations is, of course, are thinking too much about it. <laughs> now, in the 11th century, there was a Bumpo Lama named uh, uh, Lungtern Huan Yen. And uh, he left home looking for Dzogchen teachings and wandering up in the mountains. He met this uh, guy who looked like an in Indian yogi and had a little trouble. But finally they got, got together. And it turned out that this yogi was uh, uh, Tsewang Rigtsen who was the son of uh, Dren, Dren Panamka. And from him, he received the transmission for the Yet Yetri Tassel. And the commentary on the Dzogchen of the Yetri Tassel is known as the Namka Chultzer, or the uh, Magical Treasury of the Sky. And that's written by Dren, Dren Panamka. Now here, there are three Dren Panamkas, just to make things a little confusing. Uh, the first, uh, but they're regarded as reincarnations. The first Dren Panamka appeared in prehistoric times in uh, Pazik, and he descended into our world as a white ah landing in a blue lotus flower. And when he appeared then as a human being, he was translucent, so he took on the blue color, which is why Dren Panamka is usually shown as being blue. Again, not because he's cold but because his mind is like the sky. Namka meaning sky. Okay. And he got the name Drenpa, which means uh, he whose memory is like the sky, because he could remember all his past lives. Unlike us, but he could remember. Now, his next uh, incarnation of that name was as a prince of uh, Zhangzhong, the country of Zhangzhong, who lived in the... Uh, Chunglang Mulkar, the, the silver castle at the Garuda Valley, uh, there to the west of uh, Mount, Mount Kailas. And uh, he was a, a good looking guy who then uh, married uh, uh, Urbarma, uh, an Indian, beautiful Indian princess. And uh, then they had uh, two kids. And uh, one of them was called uh, Tsewang Rigsen, and the other was called. Uh, 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 they were two boys, but uh, this princess didn't really like it there. She said, oh, it's too cold. I, I really don't want to stay. I want to go where it's warm. I want to go back to India. Well, they had a uh, discussion. He said, well, you, you know, uh, I have to have a successor on, on the throne here. So they came to an agreement. One of the sons would stay with him and the other son would go with his, his mother back to India. And uh, so uh, before she uh, left, uh, she spoke to her older son, uh, Tsewang Rigson, saying, you know, up here in Tibet, it's very cold. This is a primitive, terrible place. These Tibetans are a bit barbaric. So uh, you shouldn't die here. So she gave him uh, uh, Tsewang a uh, long life practice which then uh, prolonged his life. And so then he got the name uh, Tsewang Ritsen, the uh, uh, holder of knowledge who has a long life. That's what the name means in uh, Tibetan. And so it said he lived for a long, long time without passing away so that in future centuries he could meet with this uh, Lung Ter Lat and this uh, uh, <coughs> Bumpo Lama. Well, then uh, the princess left with her younger son, son Pema Tongdol, and uh, they crossed over the border into uh, Uriana and came to this big lake. 
And on the other side of the lake, there was a, a group of uh, Dakinis having a big party. Now, Dakinis are uh, very much like uh, witches in our, our Western uh, uh, mythology. Uh, basically, a, a, a Dakini is an independent woman. This is a female who is independent of the rule of male patriarchal society. So a Dakini is not the dutiful daughter who marries the man her father tells her to. She is not the obedient wife who is always in the kitchen making tea or coffee or whatever and cooking dinner. She's not the nourishing mother who is taking care of the brood of kids. And she's not the jolly old grandmother babysitting the grandchildren. She runs with wolves. She is uh, independent, feminine energy. And so uh, that's why in the West she got a bad re reputation as a, a witch and got persecuted over the centuries. But like the Western witch, uh, there's a medieval text uh, called the uh, Canon Episcopi, which talks about uh, German women in the uh, 10th and 11th century. It said that they would allow their German husbands to get drunk every night, and then they would pass out in bed, and then the women would get up, take off their uh, clothes, put on witches' uh, ointments, and then run out into the woods, call the wild animals, uh, jump on their backs, and ride up into the sky to file, uh, follow the witch goddess Diana, uh, also known as Frau Hörle, and they would go to uh, a suitable um, ma mountain top, often in the, in the Hartz Mountains, and uh, then they, they would have a big party on, on the top of the mountain. They'd have this big cauldron or cooking pot, put all kinds of things into it, and then while they're uh, co cooking uh, the, the, this up and uh, drinking a lot of uh, beer and so on, they're singing and dancing uh, around. Well, this, of course, outraged uh, uh, the leaders of the uh, Christian church who attacked this kind of thing because it said when, before the sun came up, uh, the German women would then jump on the animals, uh, come back home, jump in bed by the time their drunken husband woke up. This is what they used to do in the early Middle Ages. In Europe. La later, uh, the church put a stop to this sort of thing. <laughs> Anyway, they, this is what Dachinis do, so they were, they were having a party there on, on this uh, uh, Donacosha Lake in uh, Uriana, and the princess saw this, so uh, she said to her boy, uh, well, you stay here, I'm going to go off uh, to the party, and she put him on a lotus flower, which was conveniently floating in the lake, and she, she went over the other side. Well, they had a lot of drink uh, there. Uh, top quality chung and so on. And uh, so she was drinking, dancing, singing. All right, the sun went down. She forgot about her son. But then, middle of the night, she remembered, oh, my son. She came back, but if you know lotuses, they close at night. So he was inside the lotus flower. She couldn't find him. So off she went to India. And in the morning, the flower opened, and there, there he was. Well, the Dakini saw him, and they gathered uh, around him. And so he started teaching uh, the uh, Dakinis. In the meantime, uh, the king of uh, Uriana, as chief minister, were taking a walk along the shore of the lake. And uh, the king had tried to get a son to be a successor to the throne, but he wasn't successful at this. Well, then he saw this uh, shining baby boy, eight years old, teaching Dakinis, and he said, oh, this is who I'm looking for. He adopted him and gave him the name, the lotus-born Padmasambhava. So this is the Bumpo story of Padmasambhava. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, took him to the palace. And then you have the rest of the story. Later, he went to India, met, met his mother, and she gave him tra transmissions, and they had a re reconciliation. He didn't feel he was deserted by his mother. It was all skillful, skillful means. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, then the Yetri Tasso. <coughs> well, this is the, the second uh, Drenpanamka. The third Drenpanamka is the Tibetan Drenpanamka. 
He uh, was born in the 8th century in South Tibet, and uh, as a Bompo Lama, he uh, came up to Lhasa in the time of King Tisong Detsen, met P Padmasambhava, and when the king said, okay, all you Bompo Lamas, you have to become Buddhist monks now, <coughs> Grandpa Namka said, well, it's all Dzogchen. He knew P Padmasambhava was teaching Dzogchen. It doesn't matter, Buddhist bond, it's all the same. I'll cut my hair and put on uh, maroon robes. doesn't matter to me, so he did it. <coughs> but in the meantime, he hid the Bompo text uh, that, that he wrote, and also some of them with the help of uh, uh, the uh, one of the sons of Trisong Deitsen. They were also hid in uh, Bhutan at the Tiger's Cave and uh, so on. Uh, <coughs> then, uh, when we come up to the 20th uh, uh, century, there was a great master in eastern Tibet named uh, Shardza Tash Tashi Jaltsen. <coughs> now, he had a teacher named San Sanji Lingpa who was Nuban. Since the 14th century, many more teramas <coughs> have been uh, di di discovered. In Tibet, mainly, mainly gong tear. Uh, a sat tear is a, a treasure that's a physical object. Maybe a book, maybe a statue, maybe a dorje, a purba, any of these things. But a gong tear is something like what what they do in California called channeling. Uh, <coughs> it said that uh, in ancient times, same with Padmasambhava. Certain seeds were planted in the streams of consciousness, and it was prophesied that these masters, in a future reincarnation, would remember these teachings. So these are gong ter, mind termas. So these are much more common nowadays, uh, gong ter. Not, not so many physical objects are, are found in, uh, anymore. So many of them started appearing among the uh, Bompos after the beginning 14th century up to the present. Uh, some of them were found by Tertans who uh, would find both uh, Nyingmapa and uh, Bompo Termas, like uh, Dorje Lingpa. Uh, he was one of these masters, so he also has a Bompo name as well as his uh, Buddhist name. In fact, in uh, Kham, uh, Eastern Tibet, the situation was very different than uh, central Tibet. Uh, since the uh, Galugpa hegemony from the, since the 15th century, when the Galugpas took control of the government there, everything became very uh, sectarian and clearly cut. You're, you're either this or you're either that. You're Galugpa, Sakyapa, Kajupa, Nyingmapa, whatever. You know. But in eastern Tibet, things were much looser. For example, you have a family, you have four sons in the family, maybe one son you send to the Sakyapa monastery, the next son you send to a Kajapa monastery, the third son you send to a Nyingmapa monastery, the fourth son you send to a Bompo monastery. All the same family, no, no problem. So <clears throat> When uh, Namkai Norbu, who was educated as a Sakyapa Lama, because his uncle was a big Sakyapa Tulku, uh, <clears throat> he became interested in Z uh, Dzogchen. He heard about Changchuk Dorje, who was a Nyingmapa Lama, married Lama and a f f physician, and went to uh, Kondrogar, which was east of Derge, where he was being educated at Derge Gomchen. And he, he hung out there for six months and so on. Well, uh, Changchuk Dorje had a number of teachers, but among them was uh, Shardza Rinpoche, a Bumpo Lama. Because in, in Kham, people could go take teachings in, in different places. You didn't have to feel your inside a straight jacket and you can only do this and you can't do this and that. Uh, so in uh, Kham, in the 19th century in particular, a new synthesis wa was made because earlier uh, there was a synthesis made by Tsongkhapa, which became the Galupa system uh, because he did not have any Indian teachers, so he drew on the uh, Kadampa. 
the Kadampa ceased to exist because it was absorbed by uh, the Gelugpas who then occupied all their uh, monasteries. Now the Gelugpa fundamentalists who are opposed to His Holiness, saying he's become a heretic because he's practicing Dzogchen, and so he's not pure anymore. They have broken away from him uh, and have formed the new Kadampa uh, sect and are receiving a lot of money from uh, the Chinese government now to make uh, monasteries, both in Tibet and in the West, on the principle that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So better to stay away from those guys. Uh, they also invoke this uh, e evil spirit, which they say is a big uh, pr protector, but actually he's just a spirit who's an enemy of Dzogchen, because he's a reincarnation of a geshe who was an enemy of the uh, fifth uh, Dalai Lama. And his cult was revived uh, by Palankapa at the turn of uh, the last uh, century. And uh, Pawankapa was also the enemy of the uh, 13th Dalai Lama and uh, fled Tibet and got the Chinese government to invade uh, Tibet, which they did, and <coughs> occupy Lhasa. So the uh, 13th Dalai Lama had to flee to British India. But then the revolution started in China and the Chinese army left and went, went back to get involved in politics in, in China. So this is all part of what's going on uh, under the surface, which some Westerners know about, some don't. Anyway, uh, <coughs> so Shards of Rinpoche is part of this uh, remake or non-sectarian <coughs> movement in eastern Tibet. It's got its name because of three uh, lamas, Jamyang Kensi Wangpo, who was Sakyapa, uh, Jangon Kongcho, who came from a Bonpo family but became Kajupa, and Chokchur Lingpa, who is a Nyingmapa. They were all close friends, exchanged wangs and teachings and uh, uh, so on. And this started this uh, Rime movement in eastern Tibet, which uh, uh, took the p position that all the different transmissions of the uh, Dharma are valid paths to enlightenment, and that we should stop just using the yiksha, the textbooks from particular <laughs> monasteries, but go back to the uh, uh, original sources. So on the Bumpo side, Shards of Rinpoche did this. Uh, he became the custodian of the Nuban Termas of Sanji Lingpa, but he consulted all the old commentaries in Jung Jung Ban and wrote from uh, that uh, standpoint. So he's able to cover both Jung Jung Ban and uh, New Ban. And uh, in about 1935, he uh, became a, a rainbow body, and that was witnessed uh, by uh, many people in Tibet in those days. And uh, he composed the Zerna, the five treasuries, one of them, the Yingrik Zhe, the uh, treasury of uh, space and awareness, is his big collection of uh, Bumpo Dzogchen teachings. And now Yongzin Rinpoche and Kempo Tempo Yungdrung have started the cycle of teaching from that uh, in uh, Europe. Okay, we come to the Zhangjun Yinju in particular. Uh, here, the, uh, there are two divisions here. The first is the Kaju, Kaju Korso, uh, Korji, which means the four uh, cycles of the transmission of precepts. Ka is a precept, Ju is a transmission, and Korji is four cycles. So uh, these are the various uh, texts from the uh, Zhangjun Nenju, which you'll find listed uh, inside here. And so four cycles. There's the Qi core, the outer cycle, which uh, deals mainly with the view of uh, Dzogchen. So uh, there is the uh, Dawa Qi the general view of uh, Dzogchen. So it examines the Dzogchen view 
in relation to other uh, traditions, Madhyamaka, Chitta Matra, Mahamudra, Tantra, so on. And this book, uh, which I have uh, uh, edited, uh, these are teachings of Yonzen Rinpoche on these uh, subjects. So if you're more philosophically inclined, this is the book uh, to get. Uh, <coughs> and then the Nankur, this is the uh, inner cycle. This is dealing with the, the meditation practice proper to Dzogchen, and in particular, this means treacher, that is, finding yourself in the state of rikpa, or uh, contemplation. How to get into it, how to stay in it, what you do when you're there. Then the Sankor, uh, the secret cycle, this is c uh, concerned with the practice of vision or treacher. Because as I explained, when you find yourself in contemplation, in rikpa, in the natural state of the nature of mind, this doesn't mean it's just a blank space and not a nothing a anymore. You've just been a, a dewdrop absorbed into the great ocean. Not at all. Because you have within the nature of mind, it's run cell, it's inherent energy, which even when you are in the natural state, this energy manifests. And it manifests in terms of nanwa, of vision. And so this is the uh, practice of uh, Tergel. But in order to practice Tergel, it is not like going to the cinema hall or watching TV. Before you can get Tergal visions, you have to get into the state, the natural state, or into uh, Trecher. But it doesn't mean your Trecher has to be 100% perfect before you do Tergal practice. But uh, it's not Tergal unless you are able to experience, to a certain uh, degree, contemplation or the nat natural state. So this is the inner cycle, uh, uh, re representing chukpa, or uh, a activity. And then finally, uh, Yangsang core, uh, the uh, very uh, secret cycle. This is about uh, when you enter into the na natural state, uh, neluk, and you start having uh, the visions, how do you uh, relate to this? And there are four stages here in the uh, development of uh, vi vision, uh, or sometimes uh, five stages. But uh, anyway, uh, these manifest spontaneously. This is, Turgel is different than visualization, uh, we, which we have in the Tantra, because visualization is something uh, done deliberately with, with your mind and your ma imagination. You visualize something. You create something with, with your mind. Here, you relax. You enter into the natural state. And then something happens. And this is true both in Long Day and in Dzogchen Upadesha. First things uh, began to appear. These tiglays, or little spots, uh, appear in the sky or in the space. Now, there are uh, three uh, supports for Turgal uh, practice. And this is clearly uh, outlined in, in this book of uh, uh, practice. Now, before you get to that point, you have uh, first, uh, in the text, there's first the uh, Nundra. But the methods of Nundra are according to the uh, Tantra uh, system. Here, uh, there are nine practices for uh, Nandro. Uh, the first uh, is the Wangkur. You receive the empowerment, and then you vi visualize uh, the, uh, the Lama, the uh, Guru, and you do a kind of Guru Yoga. And then secondly, Tsemetakpa, uh, you meditate on the impermanence of, of life and uh, so on. Thirdly, there's uh, Dikpa Shakpa. This is a confession uh, practice. If you're familiar with the uh, uh, Nundro in the Buddhist system, uh, the Tsemi Takpa, the, the second one here, this is the uh, 
Lodonamshi, the four meditations that change your attitude or, or turn the mind. You know, uh, getting the uh, opportunities and uh, in, uh, enrichment of the precious human body, impermanence of life and inevitability of, of death, uh, the lack of any uh, permanent refuge from suffering in samsara, and the causes and consequences of karma. You meditate upon that. That's all included in this uh, uh, second uh, thing here. And then you have the uh, confession to Dorji Sempa, Vajra Sattva. Well, here uh, you visualize Shenla uh, Urkar, <coughs> and you make confession to him. And there's also a, a hundred uh, syllable mantra that you recite there, and you have the topshi, the four powers that go with this, and uh, so on. Uh, then you have number four, the semje, sem which uh, means uh, producing the or generating uh, the bodhicitta, the intention to attain uh, the enlightenment of a Buddha in order to help liberate all sentient beings from their suffering in samsara. Then you have the Gyamdra, which is uh, the going to refuge in the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. You have the outer refuge, which is Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the inner refuge, which is uh, Guru, Yidam, Dakini, the secret refuge, which is the uh, Tsalun, Tigle, and uh, the super secret refuge, which is uh, Noah, Ranjan, Tukche, or uh, uh, essence, nature, and uh, e energy. So we have those four levels. Uh, the sixth practice is the mandalbu, the uh, offering of uh, the uh, mandala. And then seventh is uh, uh, Naki Depa. This is a recitation of three principal mantras like Om Muye Sale Du. And then uh, number eight is the chota practice, where you uh, offer your uh, own body. And number nine is in the uh, uh, sol, uh, sol, uh, or uh, Laminalju, or the Guru Yoga. Again, in the text, it's the vi visualization of uh, Shenla uh, Urkar. So uh, you have then uh, in the Jawa Chakri, you first have uh, this Guru Yoga. Then you have the Ngoshi, which is the uh, principal practice. And in order to get into the principal practice, uh, you need to have a Rikpa Ngotro, a direct introduction to what is this mysterious UFO object, uh, Rikpa. And in order to get that, you first have to do uh, a little meditation practice. So it uh, speaks about uh, doing fixation on the white awe. This is using shamatha practice to introduce yourself to Dzogchen. As I said before, shamatha is not in itself Dzogchen, but it can lead to the experience of uh, Rigpa. And in Semde, this is laid out, where first you uh, begin with a mikche, that is a visualization of an object, and then mikme, you remove that object and you just fixate on a location in space. And so Chen Long Day, you begin with a, a meditation without an object and just do sky med med meditation. But you first fixate on a particular location in the sky, but then you always uh, re re relax. Well, through uh, this uh, fixation on the white awe, you get uh, some uh, experience then of what the Rigpa uh, is. And then uh, in the Zhangjun uh, Yenju system, then you begin with the vision practice. And the first uh, of these is the Munsen, the dark re retreat. And you make a dark re re retreat, which stimulates your vision. If you've ever had a sensory deprivation experience, like in a uh, samadhi tank or something, uh, you soon did discover that even though you're just lying there in the darkness, 
uh, your mind doesn't just stop, it starts producing visions. Well, uh, you prepare a, a special munkong or dark re retreat house, paying much attention to the, the vent ventilation, which is very important, because if your vent ventilation is improper, uh, you'll fall asleep with too much uh, carbon uh, dioxide. Of course, when they first uh, built the Munkong at Nam Kai Norbu's uh, re retreat place in Conway, Massachusetts, the first people who went in there, it was very nice. But then this uh, animal called uh, a moose came along and it discovered the, uh, uh, the ve ventilation system and stuck his nose in it and went, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in the house ran out screaming. <laughs> so you have to be careful of the moose <laughs> to a dark retreat. Yeah, I wonder what the position was. Yeah, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, traditionally, the dark retreat is for, for 49 days, uh, like the 49 days of uh, the bardo. Each week, uh, there is a the specific purification meditation practice that you do, uh, visualizing uh, energy circulating through channels in the body so that the master comes each week and instructs you in the new uh, purification practice. But the main practice, that's not the main practice. The main practice is treacher, just sitting there in contemplation, not thinking about anything particular, uh, in total darkness and gazing with your eyes open into uh, the darkness. This permits visions to arise. Now, of course, uh, initially uh, these uh, visions will still be very worldly and so on. But if you're in there long enough, you begin to exhaust your worldly karma. And so you have the possibility of the tiglays appearing the little dots of light, and then their development into uh, pure visions and uh, so on. But uh, what visions may occur uh, depends totally on you as an individual. All right, that is the uh, Munsem, a dark re retreat uh, uh, practice. And then you have uh, Namka Arte, you have uh, sky meditation. So uh, the first support of vision practice is total darkness. The second support for vi vision practice is the clear, open, em empty sky. So you go out there, and in the early morning, you face to the west with your back to the sun. And in the afternoon, you uh, face east with your back to the sun and gaze into the clear, open uh, sky. Now, uh, Tibet is, uh, most of it is very high and arid and dry and so on. So you get big skies, like in Montana and Wyoming, places a lot like this. But unlike the East Coast and uh, unlike Oakland this morning, it was totally foggy. So you, you couldn't do uh, sky practice uh, this morning very easily. But you can. Uh, do uh, space med med meditation with, uh, you know, like they do in Zen, uh, si sitting in, the, in the, the room here and gazing into space, but at a point not on the wall back there, but intermediate be between you and the wall and, and fixate uh, on that. And you do the fixation with your attention like there was a white awe ah here. And of course, again, you uh, always uh, re relax. And then the uh, third support for the vision practice or turgal is uh, sunlight. Now, uh, you face uh, in the east in the morning and the, uh, the west in the late afternoon, but you never gaze directly at the sun because this would uh, injure your eyes. You are gazing. Uh, below or to the side with your eyes half closed and into the uh, rays of the sun, not at the uh, sun, uh, sun of it itself. Now, the visions are not caused by total darkness, the sky, or sunlight. 
the visions arise from your nature of mind. They are represent the manifestation of the inherent energy of your uh, na nature of mind. And they are something that are not constructed by your uh, discursive mind, but they occur uh, spontaneously and they are totally perfected or uh, hundra. And then they develop, beginning first as these tigles. Uh, later these tigles, uh, well initially they're black and white, later they get colors, later they hook up into uh, uh, luguju or uh, awareness uh, chains and then they can take their, their different patterns. And later these tigles begin to open up and you see visions uh, uh, in them. And uh, you'll see uh, visions of uh, heads and torsos of Buddhas and things like this. Later they more and more develop until you see entire mandalas. And when you're doing practice, your eyes are open so your Turgel vision sort of overlays than your normal uh, impure uh, karmic uh, vi vision. And so it's very advisable not to try and drive your car at this mm -hmm. time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually this uh, develops so you totally see these mandalas and so on. And then eventually they will dissolve back again into uh, clear light. These are the Nangwachi, the four stages of vision, or uh, Nangwa, not the five uh, stages of vision as they're uh, listed here in the Zhangjun Nyinju. Uh, well, that is uh, uh, considered in the uh, secret cycle, but the super secret cycle is how you understand this. And uh, that, uh, the principal text there, in e each of these uh, four classes, there's a, uh, a principal text beginning with the Dawa Chicha. And uh, uh, then we get the Droma uh, Druk, uh, the Six Lamps, and so on. And finally, we get the Zerbu uh, Ngachik, uh, the uh, 21 Nails, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. All right, this is the uh, Kaju Korshi. Then we have the Nyamju, and there are uh, three collections of texts here. The Nyamju means experiential uh, tra transmission. Uh, in the first group, these were uh, the, the extensive teachings, and they were put into two books. One had a white cover and one had a maroon cover. So they're known as uh, Gyamuk Nyi, uh, the, the two, the white, and the maroon. Then there's the Dringpo. This is the uh, intermediate uh, uh, c c collection. So all these are experiences of the masters in the lineage. And then finally, the uh, uh, Torbu, uh, the very, uh, the Dupa Torbu, the very uh, short. Like, uh, uh, collection. So some of that we've translated, but all of it isn't uh, yet available. Now, as I said, uh, for the practice, from those texts it's not clear, but you find it clearly outlaid in the Jawa Chuck tree. So this is the Ngoji, the principal practice. Then there's uh, four more texts that explain uh, elaborate, uh, first the Datri elaborates on the view of Dzogchen, the Gom tree on uh, uh, Trecher and uh, Turgel, uh, the, uh, uh, which is the meditation practice, the Churzi, the activity practice has uh, many forceful uh, purification practices. And the last is the Takcherpe uh, D, uh, which is about uh, how you can be sure you are in the state of Rigpa and continue uh, in that. There's a couple more texts here, including Ur Ursul Dunkor, which is how to make the 49-day uh, dark retreat. So I put that as an appendix in uh, this book here. 
Now, in order to do Dzogchen, Dzogchen practice, uh, the Guru Yoga, Lami Naljur, is uh, very important. And uh, in uh, here, there is a uh, short practice for La Lami Naljur with uh, Taparitsa, who's in the, the Tankas here, who is the source for our Zhangjun Yenju uh, tradition. And so you uh, begin with the nine breathings for purification. This has been taught by Namkai Norbu Rinpoche and also by uh, Geshe Te Tenzing Wangjo. And uh, you visualize the three channels in your body. So you have the, uh, for men, the white channel, uh, lunar channel on the right which is for the purification of the negative emotion of uh, anger and of uh, lung or wind diseases, and uh, <coughs> inhaling uh, the wisdom air, you then uh, expel uh, negative energy as light blue smoke, and also purify yourself of ne negative pro provocations from uh, uh, male spirits. Then you have the uh, left-hand channel, the solar channel, which is red in color. And this is associated with a negative emotion of uh, desire. And then uh, <coughs> we can purify uh, diseases due to bile here. And the impure energy is expanded by, expelled as a light red smoke. And this also purifies any negative provocations from female spirits. Uh, then we have the uh, blue central channel, which is associated with the negative emotion of confusion. Uh, sometimes this is translated as ignorance, but it, ignorance is cognitive. This is emotive. So when you bring uh, anger and desire together, and they go wham like this, what do you get? That's confusion. <laughs> So that's the three, third poison or negative emotion. And uh, so that is, uh, uh, that channel is associated with phlegm diseases. And that negative energy is expelled as dark brown smoke. And this purifies you of any uh, naga, uh, negative provocations of uh, nagas. So first doing the nine breathings for uh, purification uh, practice. With the wisdom nectars, uh, you have the three mantras for that. Sounding Ram, you see the red wisdom fires come out of the heart of Taparitsa, and they burn away all your impurities. And then uh, you sound Yam, and you see the green wisdom winds uh, come out of the heart of Taparitsa, and they blow away the ashes of all your impurities. And then sounding mum, you see the blue wisdom waters come out of the heart of Taparitsa and they wash away any uh, remaining impurities. So uh, Guru Yoga, first of all, functions to, uh, for pure purification. Secondly, it functions for empowerment. <laughs> so you see the three mantric syllables appear on the body of uh, ta Taparitsa. A omen hum, uh, which signify the enlightened uh, body, speech, and mind of uh, the guru. And uh, from uh, the A, white A appearing in the forehead, red om at the throat, blue uh, hum at the heart, and then rays of light from those three colors come out of the body of uh, the guru and then enter into your own uh, uh, three uh, chakras, thereby empowering you with the uh, body, uh, speech, and mind of the guru. Now, in general, guru yoga functions to maintain all of the transmissions of the spiritual teachings that you've received in your pre present life, so you see the guru there in the sky in front of you as the embodiment of all of the masters from whom you've received uh, tra transmissions. <clears throat> Secondly, it serves to put you in contact with uh, your own enlightened Buddha nature, which you see 
because you're still thinking in dualistic terms, you see as the master sitting in the sky in, in front of you. Well, although you begin in a dualistic uh, fashion, you always unify. And so you, at the end of the practice, you see the guru dissolve into light, and that light is absorbed into you, either down through your head or immediately into your heart. And then you just relax and enter into the state of contemplation and feel the presence of the guru with, uh, in you. Remaining for a few moments uh, in that uh, sense of presence, then after that you recite the uh, de dedication of uh, merit. Now in both Tantra and Dzogchen, uh, <clears throat> this uh, guru yoga is exceedingly important. Also, after you receive empowerment from the guru, you may recite the prayers. In, in the book, there is this uh, one prayer that is said to have been uh, uh, written by uh, Jerpungpa himself. And we have a uh, translation of that. Uh, which I'll just read to you, uh, Emaho, and you are addressing Taparitsa while you're still visualizing him in front of you. O Nirmanakaya emanated from the mind of Kuntasankpo, your body color is a luminous white like crystal. Immaculate and of clear luster, the rays of light emanate from you into the ten directions. You are totally naked and without ornaments, signifying that you are the essence of the primordial state. By virtue of your compassion and by means of the two knowledges, you continuously contemplate the benefit of all living beings. The nectar from the hearts of all the sugatas is Dzogchen, the great perfection, which is the supreme among all teachings the pinnacle among all the vehicles to enlightenment and the essence of all tantras, agamas, and upadeshas. From the natural state, which is the primordial base, originates both the liberation that is nirvana and the delusion which is samsara, whereupon all sounds, lights, and rays, all the defects of samsara and all the virtues of nirvana become clearly visible as visions. But once having cleared away, <coughs> Uh, uh, everything, all, uh, everywhere, all the darkness obscuring the minds of living beings, everything becomes clear. Then the base, which is empty and without a source, is decisively understood to represent the soul path. Experiences and understanding become manifest on the path, and both samsara and nirvana are liberated into the nature of mind. Thus the trikaya of the fruit becomes clearly visible as visions arrayed before one in the dimension of space. To you, O Taparitsa, the protector of beings, I pray with single-minded devotion to grant the blessings of conferring empowerment upon me and upon all other beings, for the pacifying uh, all our obscurations outer and inner and secret. When I am liberated from ignorance and from all grasping at the reality of delusions, my own intrinsic uh, awareness will become manifest, and having finally realized the proper view and the conduct, at that very moment, please bestow upon me the realization of the actual meaning of the primordial state that is empty, without a source, and totally transcending the intellect. To you, O Taparitsa, our Lord, who is the protector of beings, I pray. By virtue of your compassion, may you liberate my mind stream from all entanglements upon the six <coughs> within the six destinies of rebirth. And this was the prayer made by Jerpung Nangshur Lirpo to the Nirmanakaya uh, Taparitsa, who was the visible embodiment of all the lineage gurus. So, there is a root text uh, for each of the four uh, uh, sections uh, of the uh, Kaju Korsum. Uh, the 21 Little Nails is the root text for the uh, fourth section here. There is a uh, root text. Uh, there's the uh, translation uh, here for the 
root, root text of the Zerbu Nishu Tzachik, and it has uh, an I introduction. Uh, in order to send the streams of, of consciousness of those fortunate individuals who are disciples back into the base, there exists this nectar of the profound oral transmission of the unsurpassed innermost secret doctrine, which is Dzogchen. These instructions were revealed by the primordial Buddha Kuntasankpo himself. They uncover the very root of the base that is a natural state and represent the highest peak and the ultimate vehicle to enlightenment among all the doorways into Bon. Kunta Zangpo revealed these Dzogchen teachings, which also represent the very heart of the Tantras and the very essence of all the Agamas, and taught them uh, as the most excellent among all Upadeshas. Truly, they are similar to the eyes of the body. The mind transmission was originally transmitted directly mind to mind, whereas subsequently the oral transmission was transmitted from mouth to ear with words. Thereafter, these transmissions regarding the practice of Dzogchen were written down by Jerpong Nangshir Lopo at the behest of the Lord Taparitsa <coughs> by using turquoise blue ink on conchshell <coughs> white paper. These two individuals, who were really uh, nirmitas or emanations, taught these instructions to those who were karmically suitable as Shen practitioners. Thereafter, the instructions were transmitted successively to certain <coughs> individuals belonging to late, later uh, generations in Shangchung and in Tibet. May these little nails, which represent the 21 essential points pertaining to the innermost practice of Dzogchen, strike the targets which are the minds of those fortunate disciples who are practitioners Samaya. <coughs> So these are uh, 21 uh, uh, essential points. And the first of these is a little nail of re recognizing uh, the base, the basis of everything. And this means the uh, kunshi. So I've already uh, spoken about uh, uh, kunshi meaning uh, tongpani, uh, the state of uh, shunyata. This is the source and matrix out of which uh, everything uh, arises. It is the spacious aspect of enlightenment and the uh, nature of uh, mind. As for recognizing the nature of mind as distinct from mind, there are four considerations regarding this. The nature of the mind is without thoughts. The nature of mind becomes the basis of everything. The nature of mind is a neutral state displaying neither uh, virtue nor, uh, virtue nor uh, vice. And the nature, <coughs> with the nature of mind, everything possible originates from us. And this originating is uh, unceasing. They said this is the ma manifestation of the nature of uh, mind. And then uh, there are uh, nine further points that that goes into. Well, we have the nature of mind. The nature of the mind is a single source. This is the primordial Buddhahood. There is a single uh, source, but out of the single source, there is a possibility of two paths of e evolution. And uh, one of them is the path that leads to nirvana. The other path is that which leads to uh, samsara. Uh, <coughs> the reason there are two paths is dependent upon whether you understand and recognize the natural state or whether you don't understand and don't recognize the natural state. At the very beginning, Kunta Sangpo understood. So Kunta Sangpo never fell into samsara. He never fell into delusion. So he remained from the very beginning in the nat natural state. Well, on the other hand, we did not. Uh, we did not recognize the natural state, and so we fell again into delusion. Now, we say the very beginning, but actually samsara has no beginning. Samsara is a wheel. If you take a wheel like this, where is the beginning of the wheel? This is a circle. 
Where's the beginning of the circle? It just goes around and around. This is samsara. So our lifetimes in samsara have had no absolute beginning. They just go round and around. So we say in absolute terms, samsara has never f had a beginning. Uh, in the West, uh, some people have a problem with this because Aristotle said you cannot conceive of this. You cannot conceive of an infinite series. You always must have a beginning point. And then from our biblical tradition, it begins the story with creation. Bereshith uh, Elohim, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So in the West, we're used to thinking there must be a beginning point, there must be a creation. But in actual fact, with samsara, there is no absolute beginning. Uh, there is no absolute creation out of nothingness. Samsara is the wheel that is always uh, turning. So birth and death, birth and death for us as uh, individuals and rebirth, birth and death for universes. Uh, as well, and then rebirth for, for universes as well. If there was a Big Bang, then there were many Big Bangs. Universes come and go as individuals uh, come and go. So the story uh, of samsara has no, no beginning. But then uh, how can we say, how can there be an end to sa uh, samsara? Well, if you have the wheel, you have the rim of the wheel. Each of our lifetimes in samsara is a point on the wheel, and we keep uh, going around. But if you have a wheel or a circle, you also have the center. This is where our Buddha nature is. This is where the nature of the mind is. The time and history is created by the mind sequencing events, and so then we live on the rim. But the essence here, the nature of the mind, is at the center. And so it is always there, no matter where you think you may be here. So it's all your perspective. As long as you're on the rim, you're undergoing birth and rebirth in samsara. But if you find yourself at the center, you're in Buddha enlightenment, and you're liberated from rebirth in samsara. So, this is whether you understand and recognize this or not. If you recognize this, then you remain in the center like Kunta Zanpo did. So he never fell into uh, samsara. When energy arises there, these are the evolution of the visions of uh, nirvana. But if you fall into uh, uh, non-recognition and not understanding, then delusion uh, de develops and you find yourself on the rim of the wheel again, you find yourself in samsara. And then there is the ev evolution of the visions of uh, samsara. Uh, there's another uh, text in this section called, uh, uh, Namkai Norbu call it the mirror of the uh, luminous mind. A, uh, uh, where it speaks of these two e e evolutions, the evolution of the visions of nirvana and the e evolution of the uh, visions of uh, samsara. So then it depends which path you take. So you have a single point of uh, origin, which is your primordially enlightened Buddha nature, your nature of mind, but then you have these two paths, these two possibilities. And as a result of that, you have two results. Uh, one re result, through understanding, you become a Buddha, an enlightened being. And on the other pathway, you enter into samsara and you become a uh, deluded, uh, ordinary, uh, sentient being. So the choice is up to you which way you want to go. So you better get your G GPS system. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be lost and you just uh, continue. So, this is uh, uh, Dzogchen is uh, all about. You're not constructing something you don't have at present, but uh, because your primordial Buddha nature is already there. It is like a golden image of the Buddha inside the temple but you don't see it 
unless you open the doors. So even though your Buddha nature is there, uh, still you must purify all your obscurations in order to make that Buddha nature uh, manifest. So we speak of the Buddha nature of the base, which is present within each one of us. That's the essence, nature, and enemy, uh, energy. But then we have the uh, Buddhahood of the uh, path. If we uh, compare uh, uh, our Buddha nature to the sky, uh, let's say the clear uh, blue sky up there, that's Kunchi, the state of Shunyata, the spacious uh, aspect of uh, the nature of the mind. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have the sun. The sun is like uh, Rigpa. And the rays of the sun that illuminate the surface of, of the earth here, this is like uh, uh, the various yeshes. This re represents the energy of uh, Rigpa, Rigpa itself. But normally our sky is filled with clouds. This is thoughts, obscurations, negative emotions, and so on. So only now and then do we get a, a glimpse of the clear blue sky above uh, the clouds. It's the same way with the practice of the path. Uh, then uh, occasionally we get a, a glimpse of uh, Rigpa. But most of the time it's covered up by the clouds which uh, uh, fill our head. But there is uh, the possibility of eventually dissolving all these uh, clouds. And so then we can see the uh, face of the sun totally uh, unobscured by uh, clouds, which then uh, illuminates our uh, entire life. And we find ourselves then at the uh, ce uh, center of things. So Dzogchen is about what is discovering what is already present within us, our uh, primordial, uh, primordial enlightenment, but that doesn't mean there's no necessity to practice because we have these uh, obscurations. And for we don't see the son of uh, Rig, Rigpa, uh, we're living every day in samsara on a cloudy day. So uh, that's why, even though we are potentially enlightened Buddhas, that's our primordial, primordial condition, that's potential. It is not manifest or actual at, at this point. And, still, and so there's still the uh, necessity to practice. And that's what Dzogchen is all about. All right? Are we still online? <laughs> All right. If it, now, now we can ask questions. <laughs> yeah, ask questions. Okay. You want to have a question and answer? Yes, yeah, so we, we can do a few questions. Uh, if you have to run off because this was scheduled to end at four, four thirty, whatever you can, uh, but whatever you want to do. Clouds are there, but instead of focusing on the clouds, just being attuned to the spaciousness that's holding, holding the clouds. Yes, but how do you attune? By de detuning to the other. Uh, how do you detune? If your mind is working, you ain't going to do it. No, no, it's not, it's not mind, it's perception. Well, as long as you're pre perceiving, your mind is working. Is it? Yeah. Because I explained about dusha, which is pre perception. This is the mind working, creating objects that have names and concepts. So you're looking clouds. As long as you're recognizing oh, clouds, you're still in mind. You haven't moved beyond. You have to relax that perception. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But, but, but actually... Not so easy. So. I know, but the experience that I'm talking about is, is actually more of, of the, the, sen the sensing without attaching any of the ideas. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, you become space. Instead of... Uh, 
you're gazing at, at space, you allow uh, the subject-object uh, differential to dissolve. And so you are the space that you're perceiving. And then you can be the clear blue sky. Yeah. So when you say relax that perception, are you suggesting that you relax your relationship to how you perceive phenomenon, or actual, actually weaken the perception somehow in order to allow the... the no, you, re, you relax your attachment to the perception. Uh -huh. And uh, as I said, the, uh, the perception, if you analyze it, is a complex structure and this structure is created in time. Uh, so you, in the me meditation practice, you slowly come to the point where the mind may still move, things may still rise, but you don't go along with it and allow it to carry you on a, a, a trip. Because uh, every thought that arises, including a, a, a perception, has a finite quantity <coughs> of energy. Well, if you uh, don't do anything about that, you allow it to ma manifest, but you're just there, it manifests, and then you relax in, in that, and that energy will then dissolve of itself into space. You don't have to do anything. Uh, about as long as you're, you're trying to do something about it, you're just feeding it more energy. And then the next thought comes and it, and it goes on. There's no end to thoughts. So this is the process of self-liberation. Now, in self-liberation, there's three phases. And the first, uh, chardrol, means liberation but with bare attention. It's like, okay, the clouds come. Well, you're aware of the clouds, even though you're not doing anything about it, but they're there. But then you don't do anything about it and you allow them to exhaust their energy in, into space. Well, this is not easy to do. I mean, it sounds very simple, but it's not easy to do because lifetime uh, after lifetime, it's been our habit to do the opposite. We're always trying to do something and feel we have to do, do something. Well, the next stage is called chardrol. This means liberation as soon as it uh, arises. The cloud appears, you don't do anything, but then the cloud just liberates of itself. But still there's a difference between the arising and its passing away uh, 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 again. At the third phase, it's rangdol, as it arises, it liberates of itself. And this creative inactivity, Tao, you don't have to do anything. But it's very difficult to get into that uh, space. Because I say, uh, we've trained our minds since birth to do the exact opposite. You know, so it, it, it takes a little practice. It, it, and also point, point out is that if you focus on something long enough, this what the, you try to see it as a situation, the, the, the mind disconnects and stops seeing it. Mm -hmm. Which is another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens to a persistent thought that keeps on coming, no matter how much you try to ignore it and let it fall? Oh, you don't have to ignore it. You just don't do anything about it. It'll come again and again, but eventually it will exhaust its energy and stop coming. It's doing something about the thought, attaching to it, following after it. Then you keep feeding energy into it, and it will come again and again. But even a per persistent thought and uh, obsession like, I'm, I'm hungry, I have to eat, you know. Well, all right, uh, that's a, sen a sensation, and then uh, we get attached to it, we keep thinking about it, and so on. But... Um, <coughs> Uh, if you just uh, allow it to manifest, and then uh, it will dissolve of itself. Could we utilize, could we utilize in the practice Einstein's um, head 
had come up with sort of in his um, that that time didn't really exist. I mean, I remember he said that, that he did say that time didn't really exist. But if time doesn't really exist, then I, my confusion is if, if Einstein said time didn't really exist, where does all these couples come from? Oh, he said time is relative. You know, it's uh, the same yeah, as it's, it's a space-time continuum. He's talking about making measurements and how you can locate things in time, whether you can uh, ma uh, measure uh, speed, velocity, things li li like this, uh, the mathematics of, of, of this. But uh, here, uh, time and space uh, become united like it does in uh, Dzogchen. So if you enter into self-liberation, uh, li then you suspend time. Because time is created by us sequencing our thoughts one after another. So the more thoughts you have, the more time you have. So are you saying that these couples are all just mentally created? Whole well, universe is mentally yeah. created. We're all here creating the universe. It's our collective collaboration to create this u universe. It's not just God doing it. We're all doing it along with him. <laughs> yeah. I can make the question more specific, but it might be more interesting to make it general, which is, I don't know, hardly a Westerner who's had more one-on-one -on -one time with Wilson than the number that you have. And I'm just wondering if you uh, talk a little bit about his direct style of teaching to you and his approach to well, his uh, approach is uh, very uh, direct, uh, but generally he will have the text there, but the, the text is like um, key points, and then he can uh, elaborate uh, on that, but it keeps the general uh, structure of the text. This is the formal uh, teaching. Sometimes uh, he will teach a little bit uh, in informally too, uh, but um, generally public teaching, he will uh, take a specific text and teach from that. Yeah, I think public teaching has lots of uh, tapes and transcripts and so forth. I was just wondering if there were particular moments with him that you found especially uh, powerful that you might share. Well, I put a lot of it uh, in various books, <laughs> so I can read about it there. It's hard to think of a specific incident uh, just like uh, uh, that. Oh, well, one thing, like he, uh, in Paris, they, they hit him with Neo-Vedanta, you know. Saying, oh, Rinpoche, this is Zogchen. Isn't this just the same as Vedanta? It's all one mind. So then he said, oh, all one mind. Mm -hmm. Well, then the Buddha became enlightened, but it's all one mind. How come we aren't enlightened? So things like that come up. You know, <laughs> That's a good question, though. Do you answer half of the Vedanta and Zogchen? Or well, of course, it's an interesting topic because, I mean, this comes out of Indian civilization, and as I said before, in the old days, Indian, North Indian civilization also extended up into Central Asia, too. It was all one cultural region, and uh, so uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni, he grew up in this uh, context. Now, there's different aspects to the Vedanta and different ways of uh, explaining. If you go to the uh, Upanishads, uh, there's the Karmakanda and the Jnanakanda. Karmakanda is, uh, karma here means ritual activity. And this is all the ri ritual stuff you have in the Vedas and the Brahmanas and uh, so on. Jnanakanda means the wisdom uh, uh, section, and this is the inter interpretation that you get in the uh, Upanishads. But actually, in the Upanishads, there's various different interpreters, not all the same, even though Shankara tried, tried to make it that, that way. 
And uh, most of the Upanishads are post-Buddhist. The Chandogya and Brihiranyaka, they appear to be earlier than the, the Buddha, but not much or, or earlier, but most of the rest of them. You can even find sometimes references uh, in them to Buddhist teachings, and so on, as you do also in the Bhagavad Gita, which was probably written a couple hundred years before Christ. And uh, because there's all this bubbling and uh, uh, happening, uh, there are ideas being exchanged and so on. The Buddha was in contact with the Jatala um, Brahmins and, and this and praised their uh, uh, understanding and, and this. And uh, uh, the whole thrust then of uh, Vedanta going out of the Upanishads is to get at the ultimate uh, reality. And for that, they took the name Brahma. Now, originally, uh, Brahma, which comes from a root meaning purity, uh, meant the magical power that's generated by doing uh, rituals, including the yajna, the sacrifice uh, ritual. And gradually that became more and more em emphasized so that even the gods uh, came uh, under its rule by performing certain rituals you coerce the devas to do what they should be doing and uh, so on. But then speculations uh, continued and taking this word Brahma, uh, Brahman, uh, it came to mean uh, an ultimate uh, reality and the Upanishads are very much uh, about this. And so then they make a, a distinction between uh, Nirbija uh, Brahman and Subbija Brahman, whether it uh, can have a form you can talk about or it's beyond form and so on. Well, then the I interesting the discussion is between the Buddhist understanding of Shunyata and what uh, the Upanishads and uh, uh, the, the Vedanta, Vedanta's writers mean about uh, uh, Brahman. Well, when you get to Shankara, 8th century, uh, because when people say Vedanta, they generally mean Shankara, you know, his writing. Well, he was 8th century, so long after the time of uh, the Buddha. Well, if you look at it, uh, his approach is very similar, actually. A good reason for that, because he drew on Gaudapada. Now, his teacher was Govinda. Govinda was a disciple of Gaudapada, who was apparently a Bengali. And uh, he wrote a commentary on the Mandukya Upanishads. And uh, this, uh, he more or less explains uh, this Upanishad in terms of uh, Madhyamaka, because you find him using there the arguments we, we, we find in Madhyamaka, even the ter terminology about non production and uh, so on. And then Shankara uh, adopts all of that. Now it's interesting, in that uh, Mandukya Upanishad, there's a, even an invocation that invokes the Buddha. So one wonders, well, uh, what, who was this uh, Gaudapada? He sounds like a Buddhist, but he's writing about an Upanishad. Well, maybe he was both, you know. Well, that's not a problem for me, but for many sectarian people, it becomes a problem. You know, it has to be Vedanta, it has to be uh, uh, Buddha. But he wasn't saying there was one mind. Uh, this is a more uh, theosophical <coughs> interpretation, which was later and uh, uh, so on. But uh, Shankara's understanding was quite uh, sophisticated but also rather uh, non-theistic, so that his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita is not so good, because he really has to twist some meanings there. That's why Ramajana's commentary, he's 12th century, uh, on the Bhagavad Gita is much better, because it, it is a theistic text. It's got God there. Uh, but in Buddhism, we, it's non-theistic. We, we don't have the God lang language. But with the... Uh, the Upanishads, they can lean both, both ways. Uh, uh, so some of them can get a bit theistic, others not, not, not at all. And then later interpretations, uh, Vedanta and later commentaries, you know, can go 
uh, this way or that way, but uh, Ramajana, he was a follower of Vaishnava. So, of course, he wants to exalt Vishnu as the ultimate reality, but Vishnu is a personality. So, how do you square a personality with uh, Brahman? Uh, the same problem also appears actually in Christianity. If you get into uh, the Greek theology, the Orthodox Church, not the Latin theology, because uh, the Roman uh, the, uh, theologians, they were all a bunch of lawyers, like Augustine and Tertullian and, and that, and, uh, lawyers. But uh, the Greeks were mystics. So you, you read the Cappadocians and so on dealing with this problem. And in the Greek church, they make a distinction between uh, Usia Theo and uh, Theos. Theos is God, but Usia, the, uh, uh, Usia Theo is the essence of God, like we were saying before, mind and the nature of mind. Okay, Theos, he's the grandfather figure sitting on the sky in his throne like he is in the Bible, the creator, the, uh, in charge of providence, and all, all the rest that God is supposed to do. But he's not the ultimate uh, reality, which is beyond uh, conception. That's the essence of God. It's beyond the person. Now, that is not allowed in the Roman church, because when Meister Eckhart came out with that, he was denounced for heresy, because he, he talked about God, God, but also the Godheit, uh, Godness, or the, the essence of, of God, which is beyond human uh, understanding. That's not allowed. Because I say, these are lawyers that control our uh, Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, John Calvin was a lawyer also. And, and so they put uh, theology in legal, legalistic terms. And uh, therefore, inherently, they're opposed to mysticism. <laughs> you know? But it's allowed in the uh, Greek church. It doesn't mean the individual or orthodox priest understands this at all. But... Uh, we, we have this problem in Christianity also. Yeah? I wanted to hear a little bit about those wild bikinis in the Ongo. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's off that subject. Maybe. Wild bikinis <laughs> where? Ongo. Ongo? Yeah. Well, that's a province in Tibet. I know. Yeah, well, there's uh, so very many bikinis there. I mean, some, mm -hmm. you, you can ask some, some of these people from Ongo, they can tell you about that. Uh, in uh, Amdo, also Kam, they have women lamas, they're all called Khandro. And so, for example, you have Khandro Rinpoche, who visits the U.S. Now, she's the daughter of Menli Trichen, uh, who's passed away, but when alive, he was the head of uh, the Mindeling uh, lineage, and this was his daughter. He educated her as a lama. Uh, so, in East Tibet, they, and sometimes Central Tibet, they're called Woman Lama Khandro. And uh, my, my own connection was with uh, Sarah Khandro, who was one of the teachers of uh, Dujan Rinpoche, and also the principal master of Ch Chato Rinpoche, and so on. And now Sarah Harding has, is in the process of publishing her biography. And uh, she was a very important kid teacher in re recent times in uh, Kham. You know, come and I'm the, it's Eastern Tibet, so they're right ne next to each other. Sarah Jacobi? Sarah Harding. Sarah Jacobi did her dissertation on Sarah Kondro and wrote her. And but it's her the name. same woman. Uh, actually, not. I think. No. no? Sarah Jacobi just finished her dissertation in Virginia about six years ago. Oh, well, anyway, I met Sarah Harding last year in, bon uh, in uh, uh, Berlin, and she had this uh, biography she was going to oh. publish. So maybe more more than one. More than one Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> so many Sarahs, I get them mixed up. <laughs> hmm. Well, almost five five o'clock, so yes? Back to this concept of time. Did you say that um, the Vedic astrology, especially because it's so Involved with all these topics, would you say that it's immersed in time, the Vedic astrology? Astrology deals with cycles of time. Doesn't matter Vedic, non-Vedic, Western, Eastern. They're cycles of time.
using Of course. When your bill comes due, you have to pay it. <laughs> so in practical terms, you have to deal with time. doesn't mean it's ultimately real. See, the, the distinction between practical things and relative re reality, which we're all existing in, I mean, the policeman is in charge of our relative reality. I mean, yes, we're enlightened beings, we're intrinsically free, and so on, except the policeman is there. No. You find very similar inter interpretations. This is, uh, there's no absolute line, Western, Eastern. Can I, can I try to, to say that an analogy, that analogy with a circle in the center of the circle is very striking. And I think this question about time really goes back into that analogy because if you read at the center of this, we will turn. So whatever you actually see on a, on a, on a, on a, on the wheel itself is really manifestation of that samsaric. So time is a manifestation of samsaric mind that actually went into the drought. And everything that pertains to time is valid to samsara, but it's not ultimately valid in the center. Yeah, Right. exactly. So it has its relative reality and its practical reality. You have to deal with the passing hours, but it doesn't mean it's ultimately real. All right, at five, so I think we will <laughs> conclude. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Okay.